So my name is Peter, and I'm going to talk about evolving the olfactory system. And every single step of this work was done together with Robert. Robert is here in the audience today. He's a postdoc with Larry, and this work is closely supervised by both Richard Axel and Larry Abbott. Okay, so I'm primarily an experimental neuroscientist, and as such, I don't know anything. However, this is my first CCN conference, and I can only assume that this logo next to CCN means that we're supposed to be studying at the intersection of cognition, computation, and neuroscience. So I'd like to first thank the program committees in choosing a talk that has nothing to do with at least two of these three things. <laughs> and also credits to David for the emoji. All right, but really, you guys are all serious neuroscientists and you want to understand how the brain works, ideally. So why do you care about something like olfaction? Well, I'm going to argue that currently we don't have any idea about whether the networks that we have trained in order to perform all the tasks that we have given it can, re can resemble anything close to what the brain does. And it's not a fault of the artificial neural networks that we're training. It simply is we don't have any constraints on the anatomical and functional connectivity. However, this is not true in olfaction. In olfaction, especially recently, the level of anatomic and functional detail that we have on the early connectivity is exhaustive. And therefore, we are afforded a unique opportunity in order to understand whether if we train a neural network to perform olfactory tasks, whether that neural network evolves connectivity that resembles anything like biology. So let me show you how the olfactory system is laid out in fruit flies first. Olfactory perception is initiated by the binding of odors onto olfactory receptor neurons that are expressed in the sensory epithelium. Every single olfactory receptor neuron expresses one out of a given 50 unique olfactory receptors, the expression of which causes them to project with spatial precision onto a defined locus within the, within the uh, antenna lobe. And that is visualized genetically in yellow here. Second order neurons, the projection neurons, in turn, innervate and sample from a single olfactory glomerulus out of 50, thereby creating a one-to-one -one mapping between olfactory receptor neurons, ORNs, and PNs. They, in turn, innervate a large population of expansion layer neurons called Kenyan cells in a sparse and random fashion. So here are the two motifs that are present in the olfactory system. The first is that, again, there is a one-to-one -one mapping between olfactory receptors and projection neurons. And the second, perhaps more incredibly, is that there is anatomical evidence to definitively show that every single Kenyan cell out of all the 2,500 Kenyan cells samples sparsely and also randomly from projection neurons. In fact, there is a precise number, seven, there are seven random inputs innervating every single Kenyan cell. And this is sort of similar to like us knowing the entire connectivity of the higher visual system. The fact that we know this about olfaction it is because the olfactory circuit is remarkably compact and simple to characterize. And this can be nicely summarized as a three-layer feedforward system composed of 500 olfactory receptor neurons in the first layer that express 10 duplicates of 50 ORN types. They, they then project to innervate 50 PNs and then expand onto 2,500 Kenyan cells. And moreover, the flies learn to associate odors with unique outcomes because the final layer of connections are modified during, during learning to accommodate for learning. And the amazing thing about the olfactory system is that the anatomic and functional organization is similar in the fruit fly and in the mouse. This is an amazing fact because these two species are separated by 600 million years of evolution and yet have evolved the same solution independently this three-layered feedforward system in order to solve olfactory learning. So the first question that we want to ask is if we ask a machine to classify odors, will it also build the same structure? 
And we use a very simple olfactory classification task that we believe resembles the essence of what flies have to do, which is associate any odor in its environment with any possible outcome. So in this simple task, we simply give the network a million different odors. Every odor activates a set of 50 olfactory receptor neurons, and its activation determines which class it should belong to. And that's it. Initially, we provide a fairly constrained network where we specify the number of neurons per layer and also the number of layers to be the same as the fruit fly olfactory system. However, all the connectivity between every single layer is, are initially initialized to be dense and random. And we ask what connectivity evolves in this network to, to, to support classification performance. So right now, I'm going to show you the connectivity from the first layer, from the 500 ORNs on the y-axis to 50 PNs on the x-axis as a function of training. And the first thing that we observe is that connectivity very rapidly converges to the glomerular solution. You see that after training, there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between ORNs expressing the same olfactory receptor and to the same projection neuron. And this representation tiles the entire field of all ORNs onto all PNs. Now, what happens if we look at the next layer from the 50 projection neurons to the 2,500 Kenyan cells? For brevity, I'm only going to show you the first 30 Kenyan cells because I can't plot that many. And what we see emerge is, again, it also converges upon the biological solution, which is that the 50 projection neurons send sparse and random inputs onto the output layer of Kenyan cells. So let's play a game here. Just look at every single column, or like just pick a column to look at. You'll see that the connectivity of the neurons that you picked probably converges to a number that is relatively close to six to eight. And to analyze this a little bit more in detail, we first look at the connectivity before training. We've simply initialized it such that every single Kenyan cell receives all 50 inputs from PNs with the same weight. However, after training, we observe that these connections segregate into two distinct mo um, modes in which there is a set of weak connections and a set of strong connections. We can simply threshold these connections after fitting to a mixture of Gaussians, and then find that indeed every single Kenyan cell appears to receive seven projection neuron inputs that are strong on average, recapitulating exactly what we observe in the biological system. I should say now that the only constraint that I have imposed, that we have imposed onto this network, is that of non negativity. The connections from all different layers must be positive, and that's it. So currently, the network model I've imposed has a fair bit of constraints. We've constrained the number of neurons per layer and also the number of neurons per layer, sorry, and, and also the number of layers as well. What if we relax these factors? Will a different but also optimal solution evolve to accommodate olfactory learning? So in order to test this, we used, instead of a feed forward network model, a recurrent network model, in which there are 3,000 neurons in the network, and every single neuron is connected to all other neurons. And we simply take the readout at a further time step corresponding to a network that has the same number of hidden layers as a number of time steps of computation in a recurrent network. So if we take the readout at time step equals two, that corresponds to two hidden layers in a feed-forward network, except that the connectivity between the hidden layers are, are the same. Now, when we do this and look at the activity of this neural network, we observe that at, time, at a step one, the network doesn't actually choose to use all 3,000 of these connections, sorry, of these neurons. Rather, it only learns to use 50 of them. And moreover, the connectivity between step zero and step one corresponds to the glomerular solution that we have previously observed in the feed-forward network, even if we don't constrain 
or the number of neurons. We also observe that at step two, these 50 neurons then undergo expansion to innervate all 3,000 of the neurons. So the network learns to use all 3,000 neurons for a behavioral, uh, to read out activity for learning at the readout step. And moreover, the connectivity between time, uh, step one and step two also corresponds to sparse random connectivity that we have previously observed. What if we endow the network with more steps of computation? If we take the classification readout at a further time step of three? Rather than using this additional layer of computation, this network simply copies the neural activity that is present in step one onto step two. Because you see that the active neurons is about 50 at both time steps, and actually the connectivity matrix is close to an identity matrix as well. So this says to us that even if we endow the network with more room for additional computation, it actually does not choose to use it. The optimal solution really does appear to be a three-layer network with 50 neurons in the first layer and, and a lot of neurons in the expansion layer. So it appears that these motifs, the one-to-one -one matching between ORNs and PNs, and also the sparse random connectivity is fairly robust. So why did the fruit fly, the mouse, and the machine evo sorry, evolve the same system? The first insight that we have gained by manipulating the system is that a large expansion layer is necessary for odor classification and also determines the level of ORN mixing in the PN layer. We test this by training a feed-forward network model, except we vary the number of Kenyan cells that are present. And we find that as the number of Kenyan cells decreases from what we observe in biology, the accuracy of classification in this task also decreases as well. And moreover, we observe that as we decrease the number of Kenyan cells, the level of mixing of ORN inputs in the PN layer also increases as well. We use the very simple metric called uh, glow score or glomerular score to quantify the degree of mixing. A high glow score of one means that there is no mixing of ORN inputs, and a low glow score means that there is a lot of mixing. And you see that as we decrease the number of Kenyan cells to something like 100, there is starting to be a lot of mixing. So the conclusion that we take away from this is that if there is no allowance for mixing to occur downstream, the mixing starts earlier. However, if there is the opportunity to mix downstream, then information would be preserved earlier. So this property of a glomerular solution is not self-contained, but rather depends upon subsequent layers of computation. And a, pro a harder question to answer is, why is the Kenyan cell input degree 7? I'm going to, to define input degree as just K for simplicity here. So we were initially quite um, confused over why, and we sought out the internet for answers initially. And we came across this website that um, you know, tells you the meaning of numbers, right? Why seven? And amazingly, a week has seven days. There are seven stairs to heaven depending on what, what religion you're in. There are seven colors, and there are seven planets, seven keys of music. So to us, it seems like it's a very important number, <laughs> right? Like, how did seven evolve and emerge in our networks and in biology? What is the reason to this? And the simplest solution, the simplest hypothesis that we've came across, or that we first tested, is that sparse connectivity of seven simply leads to higher accuracy, all right? And, and in order to test this, we first fixed the connectivity between the OR and the PN layer to be the glomerular solution. And we simply varied the K in our networks, the input degree of Kenyan cells, of uh, Kenyan cells. And we find that, to our surprise, a variety of networks with variable K actually performs all the same. There's really no difference in either accuracy or loss for a variety of K values from three to 15. And we were quite puzzled by this result. So we decided to look at it more carefully. 
because clearly class, uh, classification accuracy does not lead to sparse connectivity. And it turns out that when we examine loss and accuracy as a function of training during early training, we observe that actually there is an optimum at seven. So it appears to us that sparse connectivity of k equals to seven leads to faster convergence and faster learning. Mathematically, we don't understand why this is right now, and if anyone have insights, I would love to talk in the future. This also leads to a further prediction, which is if sparse connectivity leads to faster convergence, then fast learning should also require sparse connectivity. And in order to test this, instead of giving it one task, we now employ a meta-learning framework where we give multiple tasks in sequence, except the difference is that these tasks only contain a few examples of each odor. Um, so this is really a, a few shot learning where we give the network few examples of odors where every single task has a random classification boundary and it's supposed to learn to generalize according to these few odor examples onto new odors. And we've employed a, a pretty recent meta-learning framework called Model Agnostic Meta-Learning, or MAML, by Chelsea Finn and colleagues at Berkeley. And we've, we've constrained only the output layer from the Kenyan cells to the readout neurons to learn during a new data set. Conceptually, this is like we are evolving the connectivity between every single layer and relegating learning to only occur at the output layer, which is also exactly biologically inspired. And indeed, we see that the connectivity that emerges from the PN layer to the Kenyan cell layer is also the sparse connectivity. Therefore, sparse connectivity is what supports fast learning as well. And we also see the same glomerular solution to emerge from ORNs to PNs. So in summary, we have quantitatively recapitulated biological connectivity through machine learning. And moreover, information is preserved from ORNs to the PNs in our task if there is an opportunity to mix downstream. And finally, we believe that the Kenyan cell input degree of seven leads to faster convergence during training. Thank you all for coming, and thank you to all our collaborators, and especially Robert here. Thank you. Okay, we have time. We have time for one or two questions so that we can get to the coffee break and try to stay somewhat on schedule. So, burning questions. Hi, great talk, great idea, I love it. Thank you. Question is, how sensitive are your results to the statistics of the input stimuli that you're giving? Right, so we've, we have t tested a multitude of tasks that are completely different. Um, I'm happy to talk about this with, with you later. So tasks where the classification boundaries should be concentration invariant, um, tasks in which multiple areas are associated with the same output. So it seems to be that these, re uh, these results are robust to all of those uh, factors. However, we haven't used like realistic odors in our task. Um, this is something that we can further explore in the future. Yeah. Hello. Uh, thanks. Uh, what uh, training algorithm did you use to evolve the... Right, so we've uh, used Atom as an optimizer, and uh, this is trained through simple stochastic gradient design. Yeah. Okay, uh, let's thank all the speakers again.